Okay, all right, so it's time we get things moving. We've got a fun-packed hour ahead of you, as always. It constantly amazes me how much uh, topics, how many topics and things we always manage to come up with every quarter. So we've got an entertaining and informative session ahead of you uh, for the next hour, covering all the different products and feature updates that we've been uh, doing at Meraki since uh, we last spoke to you, which was right at the back at the beginning of January. Uh, before we get into the deck itself, uh, we have a contest winner from our community, uh, the Meraki community. We run a photo contest for uh, the front cover page of the Meraki Quarterly. This is a very prestigious place to be, and so uh, we're really excited. Our uh, winner today is uh, M. Souza on the Meraki community, so congratulations to you. I hope you're on the call today, and uh, thank you very much for submitting your uh, image. We'll certainly run this again uh, when we come back and do this next quarter. All right, so before we get started, I want to remind you of the ground rules for the Meraki Quarterly, a little different to our regular uh, webinars. These are really targeted at established uh, Meraki customers and partners, so we're expecting you to have a pretty good understanding of the Meraki portfolio already. If you are brand new and joining us for the first time today, then of course you're very welcome. Uh, thank you for taking time to join us. And uh, we have a webinar series which is designed to help get you up to speed uh, where you can get familiar with the Meraki portfolio and all of the benefits it's going to bring you. Uh, but you may find the pace a little fast today because we will be assuming some of that prior knowledge as we go into updates uh, on all the different products. I want to stress, as I do every quarter, that this is a retrospective look back over the last quarter. So we have some rules here for how the quarterly works. Uh, we don't talk about roadmap, and we certainly will uh, retain the right to ignore any questions that you put into the Q&A panel about the roadmap. And uh, so feel free to submit them, but we will feel free to ignore them. Uh, we're designing here to, to look back and make sure that we're bringing you up to speed uh, so that you know what has been happening with us. Now, I mentioned that Q&A tab. Uh, please do use that to ask any questions that you have. Uh, we want to make sure that we try and get those answers for you during the hour. And we have a panel here, um, all keen and excited to welcome questions for their respective products. Uh, we'll do our best to get them answered. And we'll share a few of those questions with you towards the end of the hour as well. So before we get things started, uh, I just want to just quickly show you the agenda. It's very simple. Uh, we are going to go into product updates. Uh, that will take the bulk of our time today. But then we've got a nice new session where we're going to have a look at the Meraki community and some of the ways in which it can help you uh, on your journey with us. Uh, we're very keen with Meraki to keep our users engaged as much as possible. And that's really because things move fast. And we want to make sure that we have platforms for people to keep in touch with us. And the community is a great way to do that. So we'll go into that a bit more detail later on. And we'll wrap things with a Q&A towards the end of the hour. All right, so time is moving on. And I'm going to pass things over to Sarah Lynn, who is joining us from a trade show in Las Vegas uh, today uh, to bring us a very exciting update on the MV smart cameras. Over to you, Sarah Lynn. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, everyone. And I just want to let the person who won our photo contest know that the MV team has volunteered to go on site should you ever have any problems with that camera. Um, beautiful photo. We were very excited to see the camera featured in such a nice area. Uh, so when we do the quarterly, we're also thinking about what have we been working on since last launch. So We've got a lot of new features, and we actually did another launch. So we have a kind of packed agenda to talk about with MV, uh, just because as the engineering team really does like to stay busy. So the first thing I want to update on is not a new feature, but just kind of uh, some more visibility so you can be assured that everything is working properly on your MV cameras. We've added the ability to monitor the wireless configuration status to both the list page as well as the network page for each camera. So the Envy cameras can do wireless. You can configure multiple SSIDs uh, as a primary and a backup. So this gives you visibility into knowing uh, the state of that and just uh, assuring you that everything is functioning, functioning as needed with your cameras. And the next piece that I want to talk about is a new API that we released in the last quarter. It's the Snapshot API. So this allows you to get a sneak peek into what is going on uh, in a camera without actually viewing video. I really like this API. It's a RESTful API, so you can use it to access a screenshot from live or historical video. Um, you can kind of do it on demand. Uh, I've got a snapshot here. We've uh, one of our uh, teammates here has built a Meraki bot on uh, WebEx Teams, so you can request a snapshot from some of the cameras we've set up here. This is a very simple 
use case for it, but it can also be used in conjunction uh, with other systems triggered by events and maybe a badge access system or something like that. So an event occurs, request snapshot, and you've got that information right there to go. And it can also be used to add context in the motion alert. So you can get motion alerts when something happens and then get a snapshot so you can see, hey, is this something that I need to go look into as well? So, and then the final kind of new feature update before we get into the launch is uh, we've added the ability to get Lux levels or light levels uh, with the NVSense API. There's a couple different use cases for this. The first uh, that I want to talk about is connected lighting. So you can set up the thresholds for Lux levels in an environment, and when NVSense detects that it has fallen below that or above that, it can change the lighting. So, hey, the room has gotten dim, let's turn the lights up so that our employees can continue to work happily, uh, or we can increase the safety of people in that building. And then speaking of safety, the other uh, use case for Lux levels is safety and security. So if you have spaces there where the Lux, label, Lux levels should not change, should not be outside of a certain threshold, and NVSense detects that, it can be used to trigger um, an alert or have some action taken as needed. So if there's a room where no one should be in, it's dark, it detects that there's some light in there, or if someone is opening a door and there's a crack of light that peeks through, again, NVSense can detect that send notifications, take actions, so you can uh, rectify the situation. All right, so now I wanna talk about the spring launch. We managed to get this in just before the uh, deadline for the quarterly, so I can give you a brief update on this if you haven't uh, seen the information on it, but if you do want more information on the launch, I encourage you to go check out the launch materials, the blog, uh, the launch webinar. So this will be kind of a very quick high-level overview of it. So our team is never happy with things as they are. They're always looking to see how can we make things better. And one of the things that we were able to make better is uh, motion search with, uh, with this launch and the new second generation cameras that we have. So motion search is really great. It gives you the ability to not have to watch a lot of video if you wanna try to figure out what is happening. You can select an area um, on a screen and a general time frame, and the cameras will um, pull that information up and the dashboard will return results for video that contains motion in that area. Motion Search 1.0 just looked at pixel changes to detect motion, uh, and this was very good, but it did uh, present some difficulties with uh, night or um, kind of low contrast scenes where there wasn't a lot of color changing. The new Motion Search 2.0 has a more powerful detection algorithm, so we've been able to increase the fidelity for small, uh, small changes, reduce false positives, which will actually improve uh, motion-based retention if you're using that, and offer a lot better sensitivity at night. So the screenshot you're looking at on the right there is uh, a visualization of the Motion Search, so we're able to detect hey, that, that figure with that bike uh, is in motion, the rest of that, everything that's in black is background, nothing's happening there. So I'm really excited about this. Motion Search uh, 2.0 is great, but Motion Recap uh, should make everyone's life easier if they're using Meraki smart cameras. So we're taking the information that we're getting from Motion Search to build these composite images inside the camera. Uh, and what you're seeing here is uh, on the slides on the right are the summarization of activity in a single image. So I can now look at search results and X right into that video and see if this is video of the footage I'm looking for without actually having to spend time watching it. So in the top one, you can see that uh, we have an employee at the Meraki office. They come in from the back left side of the frame. They walk around the counter. They come in. They're actually filling their water. That's a little bit off frame, but we know if in the office we're familiar with where that is. And then they are walking off, taking a sip of water. So we can figure all this out in an instant by looking at this picture rather than having to watch 30, 45 seconds of video. The screenshot below is from our Cisco store where we've got Meraki cameras uh, running in a live store environment, the Cisco office in San Jose. Again, and you can see multiple people moving around uh, and really get an idea about what's going on in your store much faster. All right, and 
If Motion Recap and Motion Search 2.0 weren't exciting enough, we also uh, just announced a new camera model. It's the MV32, it's a fisheye camera. And this picture really doesn't do it justice. Uh, it's actually very, very small. Uh, the picture makes it look a little bit big here without a lot of context. Uh, it's got a super high resolution 8.4 megapixel sensor and it has the ability to do some in-browser de-warp with live and historical digital pan tilt and zoom and we'll show you that uh, in the demo in just a second. It's also uh, virtual reality or VR enabled um, which enables you to kind of virtualize a space, uh, envision what is happening, see what is happening and what it looks like without having to actually be there. Awesome, and so the last thing I wanna uh, tell everyone about is the new telescoping pole mount that uh, we announced as well. This will be compatible with the MV12 and the MV32, and it is an expandable, as evidenced by the name telescoping, uh, and so it can go from uh, about just under 13 mil mil 1,300 millimeters to uh, 2,300 millimeters, which ends up being about seven and a half or eight feet wide, and this will really help in uh, large areas with high ceilings to be able to lower those cameras uh, down closer to the ground or closer to what you're looking at so you can get a better detail as far as what's going on on the ground there. Uh, the SKU for that is on there, it's MA-MT-MV-40. All right, and the next slide, uh, we want to show you a demo of the new MV32, so we're going to switch over. Perfect, so this is the dashboard for the Cisco store. As I mentioned, this is a live store. We've got Meraki cameras running here. And uh, we've got a variety of cameras, MV12 and the MV32. So we're gonna go to the MV32s. Yeah, that's perfect, the middle one there. So if you could, perfect. So now we're gonna pull up the video for this fisheye camera. And just kind of a note on the video here. So. The, when you're watching video um, over WebEx, there may be a little bit of a lag there. So we really do encourage you to um, talk to your rep, maybe get a trial if you're interested in that so you can see what the video really looks like uh, in your own environment. So we're looking at what we call a warped view of the camera here. That's that circular image. And so you're really seeing um, a 360 degree view of what's going on inside this store. And you can see that down in the middle there in the center, things look pretty clear, uh, but they start to get distorted around the edges and that's just because of the warp circular view. So let's do a motion search on here if you wanna click motion search actually first. And uh, select that area of merchandise that's in the center, those two racks of t-shirts there. And we wanna tell the camera, hey, let's look to see what happened in this area. Now, this is the morning uh, in the store here. So we have got some results as uh, people have started to set up and come in. But the first thing uh, that I hope you notice is that instead of seeing that list of video results with uh, the date and time and some other numbers on there, you're actually seeing those motion recap images that give you a sneak peek into what's happening. So uh, the screens that we're looking at here, you can see the one in the middle on the top, you've got what looks like, uh, you know, maybe an employee or something walking from the back to the front. The one on the right, you've got a gentleman who comes in from the, uh, the door there and walks to the racks. And so you can see how much easier it is to kind of find what you're looking for. And if you want to click on one of those thumbnails, you can look at an enlarged view um, of the events and you have the ability to kind of click uh, event two of eight, and you can click through um, to see different events. And now I just wanna point out that um, each of these images, if you wanna stay here, each of these images captures 30 seconds of an event. And so if you have a motion event that's longer than 30 seconds, there'll actually be two images that will show, and you can scroll between the two images. At the bottom part of that, um, there's a previous image and a next image uh, that you can click through to look at the next image for that event. But if this is the, Perfect. If this is the uh, event that you want to look at, like, hey, I think this is that person that they said that came in, you can actually click on the play video button from here, and it takes you back up to the top. If you want to click out exit search, that way we can see um, what's happening a little bit better without those green lights in there. Now, this is the warp view again, and if you want to, if you come down to the bottom and click on that plus arrow, then we'll enter what we call DPTZ or digital pan tilt and zoom. Uh, mode on the camera and what that will do is it'll immediately put you into a de-warp state and you can use the um, your mouse 
uh, or your trackpad or whatever is to kind of drag the view of that screen around. So you can, uh, Simon, if you want to drag it around. And now we can see, oh, there's that gentleman who came in. It's a little, <laughs> we're a little bit slow on our timing here. It's a little difficult to kind of do this uh, almost uh, demo by proxy over line, but you can kind of see how you can move around and see different parts of the scene and actually look at an event from multiple points of view on one camera to get better context into what's going on without having to switch uh, back and forth between cameras. So you have the ability to look at the full 360 degree of this view, as well as use your mouse to scroll in if you want to get, or to zoom in, oops, if you want to get some additional details on here. So you can see we can move in and, uh, and see what, you know, what is that gentleman looking at that rack? And so this makes it easy to figure out what's going on uh, without looking at multiple cameras. And the fear that MV32 works really well when complemented with uh, some of our fixed cameras around entrances and exits, so you can get kind of detail um, on a person as they, you know, come in or out of a store. All right, so that is all uh, that we have time to give you a sneak peek on right now. If you have, again, you know, additional questions or want to look at more, we really encourage you to uh, check out the other resources on the launch. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to Amelie with SM, I believe. Hi, everyone. Good morning. This is Amelie covering for Systems Manager, and we have a couple new updates. So the first one being um, DEP highlights. Previously, admins could only manage one DEP server per organization and systems manager. And so this led to having to create separate organizations in order to support multiple DEP servers. But now, customers can add, remove, and edit multiple DEP servers within the same organization in the Meraki dashboard. So this results in more flexibility to deploy devices that are being procured under one subset. And this experience will be more seamless, efficient, and granular. And you can now specify which DEP server should be visible for management and syncing under each network. Also under this category, we, have, we support the ability to automatically assign DEP profiles to devices. This removes the hassle of having to manually assign a profile to newly synced DEP devices. It also ensures a level of consistency when Apple devices are synced into Systems Manager. This ensures that customers and their devices will be associated with Systems Manager out of the box. Now I'll talk briefly about Onus Refresh page. What we've done this quarter is we've just worked on the back end which means that nothing should look different for the user experience. It really is all about <coughs> creating a better view. It's revamped and modernized. We've done enhanced Apple School Man Manager Sync as well. Activation lock bypass. So if you're an Apple user, uh, iOS 7 includes a feature called activation lock which makes it difficult for someone to use or sell an iOS device if it is lost or stolen. And so when providing organization-owned devices to users, however, this can become a hassle if the device must be reset or re allocated to a new user while a personal Apple account is signed in. And so for these cases, Systems Manager has a feature called Activation Lock Bypass to circumvent activation lock. And there are prerequisites, so please check out Meraki documentation for that. But once you've met those prerequisites, you will see the activation log bypass tool appear under the MDM commands section of the client details page. And finally, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of Sentry features. So if you are a customer who has deployed Meraki access points or Meraki SD-WAN appliances, um, please take note of our Sentry features. These are net, net, network native integrations, and this is what differentiates uh, Systems Manager in the MDM space. And so through the integration with Meraki uh, access points, we have Sentry enrollment where network administrations can configure SSIDs to only allow devices with Sentry, Systems Manager installed. 
And then there's also Sentry Wi-Fi security, where Wi-Fi access can be automatically deployed to devices based on Systems Manager's knowledge of device type, user group, location, security uh, compliance, and etc. And you can also have the option to leverage Systems Manager's built-in certificate in infrastructure to provision authentication with certificates. So it really eliminates the need to manage a certificate authority, radius server, or public key infrastructure. And now on the MX side, we have Sentry VPN, which allows you to provision client VPN automatically with the Meraki MX while controlling access based on time of day, user group, geolocation, so on and so forth. And then the last feature with MX is the Sentry policies, where we can dynamically grant or restrict network access to a device based on its security status, location, installed software, or OS version. And when a device fails to comply with a set of security measures, so for example, someone jailbreaks a device, Systems Manager can automatically revoke access to Wi-Fi networks. So if you are interested in testing out these features, please um, contact your account manager to run a trial and get MR, MX, SM in your network. And now we're moving on to wireless access points with David. Hey, everybody. This is David. Uh, I'm product marketing for Meraki Wireless. So a couple quick updates for you guys. The first is that in January, we released the public beta of our MR26.1 firmware. Uh, so the term firmware upgrade itself doesn't sound all that attractive, but our MR team here at Meraki gets really excited about it. <clears throat> our goal is to drive customer satisfaction with really predictable software quality and upgrades as we launch these new firmware versions. And due to the fact that we at Meraki now have a massive scale with millions and millions of Meraki wireless nodes to test and roll out that firmware via the cloud, it vastly increases the stability of every firmware release that we do. And we've seen a steady uptick in the reliability as we've gone from MR24 to MR25 firmware, and we definitely expect the same with this new MR26 uh, firmware. So with the launch of the new firmware, we do have a lot of new features that you might have heard about in the past. We've talked about them a little bit, but they've sort of been hidden behind uh, some requests that you would have to make to the support team to have them enabled. Well, now they're all available in public beta, and you'll see them visible in your network as long as you are running the MR26.1 beta firmware. And the first piece here is the umbrella integration on MR. Certainly we've talked about this in the past, but for those of you who are not familiar with Umbrella, it does have the ability to have a really rich dashboard from the Umbrella side to add DNS layer security, content filtering, configure group policies, and then apply those um, to a Meraki access point or an SSID that you have. So with MR26.1, you can now enable the link between the two technologies on the Umbrella side and the Meraki side with an API key, and you can import those Umbrella policies into the Meraki dashboard um, and then apply those on SSIDs. So you will see that available with this firmware um, as soon as you upgrade. And we've got lots of content available on that integration online if you want to go take a look. The second piece is an alternate management interface. So with MR26.1, the, really the beauty of this capability is that for those organizations that are dealing with extremely conservative security teams where they have to get lots of approvals and they have aversions to the cloud, you can go ahead and filter some information away from the cloud. So both MR and MS can be placed um, on the public network with a secondary virtual interface available to send certain types of traffic. So um, for example, SNMP, syslog, radius log info, you can send via an internal VLAN. Um, and with that separate VLAN, you can make sure there's complete isolation of that alternate management interface and the public internet. And you can definitely read more about that on the Meraki documentation page. Finally, uh, mandatory DHCP. So this adds a little bit more simplicity to your security. We've obviously all got uh, lots of dynamic environments with mobile devices. And configuring the security settings on a static IP with all of these different devices just really isn't that scalable. So when this setting is configured, clients with static IP addresses 
without a DHCP lease are disconnected. So as long as you have an 802.11ac Wave 2 capable wireless access point from Meraki uh, running the latest MR26 firmware, it does support this feature. So lots of exciting new things here uh, with the new firmware release. We definitely like to hear uh, your experience so far testing that out. Now I do want to talk about the next generation wireless landscape. So I'm sitting here in a room with several other Meraquians. We've all got laptops out that are connected wirelessly. We've got phones that are connected wirelessly. We've even got some Apple Watches around here. So lots of really dense environments that we're all dealing with, not only um, everywhere, but here at the Meraki corporate office as well. Um, I was sort of curious and I looked up in the Meraki dashboard to see how many clients do we have connecting wirelessly to our network, and how does that compare to last year? And what I saw was last year around the same time, we had about 1,300 uh, different clients that were connected. And today we have over 1,700 clients that are connecting into the network. So a huge increase in the wireless clients. We've definitely grown a lot at Meraki, so we see an increase in, in clients. But every Merakian and, and um, users all around the world are increasing the numbers of clients that they have. And that creates lots of challenges on networks where not only do we have all of these mobile devices, but we've got people moving around. They're more dynamic. They're, we have large events that we host here at Meraki, whether they're recruiting events or we're hosting customers or partners. Some of you may have been to the, to the Meraki office here in San Francisco. And a lot of this puts a strain um, on our wireless network. So good luck to our IT team. Um, the other piece is that a lot of our customers are seeing growth in new technologies. So augmented reality and virtual reality technologies are being used, uh, whether it's in schools for new learning technologies or manufacturing floors that are trying to increase their operations efficiencies. Um, these new different applications, you know, HD and ultra HD 4K video, 8K video um, are all growing and causing strains on our networks. And then finally, by 2022, IoT devices are expected for the first time to be more than half of all global connected devices. It's pretty amazing. Um, and Gartner estimates that 80% of those IoT projects will be wireless. So all of these challenges are really straining our wireless networks today and uh, causing the need for a next generation of wireless. So that brings me to Wi-Fi 6. So this is the next generation of Wi-Fi. Uh, it's synonymous with 802.11ax, and it's designed to handle a lot of these modern challenges. And, and unless you've been hiding from the world of networking for the last few years, you certainly heard about it. You've heard about Wi-Fi 6. Um, as users increase in the network in dense environments like busy offices, shopping malls, classrooms, and even places like the manufacturing floor with this huge influx of IoT devices. The goal is for that data throughput to maintain itself over time. So in the chart on the left, you can see as users increase, 802.11ac really has challenges. It's a great technology as far as throughput and streaming, but as the client count increases, the consistency of that data throughput really isn't there. And with Wi-Fi 6, there's a whole host of over 50 new features that are a part of that standard, such as OFDMA, multi-user MIMO. There's new modulation schemes. And you're going to start hearing more about that. And um, all of these technologies work together to ultimately deliver the next generation of high throughput, high density, and highly efficient Wi-Fi that uh, increases the range and it includes power savings as well. So a lot of people are wondering, what is Meraki's strategy on Wi-Fi 6? We've talked previously about the MS-355 and MGIG switches. Uh, last quarter, we talked about some of that. We've uh, talked about 802.11ax on our blog. But I'm really, really excited to say that if you want to learn more about our strategy with Wi-Fi 6 and Cisco's strategy on Wi-Fi 6, that you can tune in on April 29th. There will be a big event that's going to be hosted from the Cisco side, um, and that's April 29th in the U.S., um, and then April 30th worldwide. And you can learn a lot more about 
Wi-Fi 6, 802.11ax, and our plans around that. So you'll hear from industry experts and influencers. Uh, we'll have a keynote, an industry panel, a practitioner panel, and certainly Meraki will be a big part of that announcement that's going to happen on April 29th. So definitely advise all of you to tune in for that. Set your calendars. Um, it should be in the morning from uh, 10 to 11.30, at least Pacific time. Um, and you'll certainly get some invites for that event happening on April 29th. So really excited about that, but I am now going to turn it over to Stephen from our switching team to talk to you about switches. Hello, I am Stephen. I'm a product manager for MS at Meraki. And if we start uh, a little bit back in 2018, we announced a new family of access layer switches with increased density of multi-gigabit ports, and that's the MS-355 series. So with the next generation of Wi-Fi 6 or 11AX access points arriving this year, multi-gigabit is no longer a luxury. Connecting one of these blazing fast APs to a regular switch could mean creating a bottleneck and compromising that end user experience. And if we follow the implications there, adding capacity in one part of the network has the potential to create a ripple effect, uncovering limitations elsewhere. So to help address this, we've introduced our fastest ever switch, built for the aggregation layer, where performance and stability are everything. That's why we launched the MS450. So if you add up the total switching capacity, the MS450 can handle an excess of 1.3 terabits per second. Yeah, terabits per second over a 70% increase from our previous gen. Up to 12 access layer switches can be connected to a single MS450, and then to ensure no loss of that capacity in a large-scale three-layer network, there are 200 gig ports as uplinks from here. Oh, and if you need more ports, it stacks too. Dedicated stacking ports on the back provide a generous 400 gigabits of stacking capacity. That's one fast switch. If we go over to the software side uh, with MS11 firmware, MS just released its newest, most robust firmware that includes a focus on quality in stacking and scaling, for example, for the MS355 and the MS450. There are also a few new features like IPv6 multicast listener discovery, the alternate management interface we mentioned in the MR section, and we've added a feature called combined power. You can choose to keep the MS350 or the MS355 in its default mode, where an additional power supply provides redundant power, or you can select combined power to utilize the full combined wattage of both power supplies for PoE. Combined power also includes an API for programmatic deployment. It's the first of the features on the switch settings page to get API support, part of the new switch settings API endpoint. Let's talk about topology for a second. We continue to improve topology as well. It started as layer two only, then we added basic layer three support, but there were a few things that needed to be shored up in terms of behavior and drawing a network topology, including a better algorithm for finding the root of the network. For instance, we no longer assume that it's an MX for those uh, more complex deployments. We've also improved the time it takes to load the pages. In most networks, it'll be two to three times faster. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Melissa to talk about cloud and APIs. I wanted to start by talking about um, an exciting milestone that we just reached, which is we cross, crossed over the 2 million active dashboard threshold. This is really exciting to us. I know cloud services and management might seem really standard or run-of-the-mill today, but Meraki has been leading this charge since 2006. And from the time when we first started shipping product in 2007 to 10 years later in 2017, it took us that time, that 10 years, to build 1 million active networks. What's really remarkable is that after that, it took us only 20 months, um, short of two years, to double that, to get to this 2 million active network threshold. So this is really what the cloud is all about and goes to show how we at Meraki and our customers are par and partners are using the cloud to rapidly scale. A little bit of data and stats around what 2 million active <laughs> dashboard networks entail. What we're seeing now is about 30 million daily API requests over 5.7 million connected Meraki devices. And thank you to all of our customers and partners. We have over 420 
1,000 unique Meraki customers. And with that, we're seeing over 70,000 active application developers using our API platform. So queuing up here, I'm going to go into some of our newest API endpoints that we've released over the last quarter. And I've broken this up by our different product lines. So on the X MX side, we have some new API endpoints that allow you to see organization-wide uplink performance information, to return or update content filtering categories, some added DHCP settings and NAT rules, and port forwarding rules. On the switch side, you're able to list the switch, switch stacks in a network or show a switch stack, add or remove switches from that stack, or even create and delete a stack using the API. Sarah Lynn gave an excellent overview over on the Snapshot MV API that was released. That's the ability to uh, call up a, an image, either um, a current image from cameras or sometime in the past, and maybe run some analytics on that image if you'd like. And on the Systems Manager side, we've released the endpoint to unenroll a device as well. And then in terms of cross-product API endpoints that we've released, there have been some new ones here around group policies, so being able to use the API to create, display, or update group policies, um, return some new fields for admins, be able to look back at your API usage and see what API requests have, are being made by an organization, and some network automation tools with WebEx, WebEx Teams. All of these API Endpoints are also available to, um, to you to check out under the What's New section on create.meraki.io as well. So if you want to stay up to date and don't want to wait till the next Meraki quarterly to take a look at that, you can visit our, um, our Create site to see that. With that, I also want to point out we will be at DevNet Create not next week, but the week following, the 24th and the 25th of April. We're really excited about this. We hope you can come join us. Um, we will be announcing some really, some really key things around our APIs and cloud at that event. So we really hope you can join in. And we do have a promo code still available for 50% off your passes if, if you can make it out there. And lastly, a couple more API resources. That Snapshot API we talked about, there is a new Adventure API Lab. So if you wanted to get that up and running and try it out yourself, you can go to cs.co slash adventure to take a look. And we do have another in API-focused webinar coming up. Um, so you can come in to that webinar and take a look at everything we're doing around APIs and ask specific questions, see some API-specific demos as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Imran to talk about our security SD-WAN and Insight solutions. Thanks very, thanks very much, Melissa. MX, okay, last but certainly not least. Good morning, everyone, or perhaps even good afternoon or good evening. My name is Imran. I look after the product marketing for the mighty MX. Uh, so the MX team has had a pretty frenetic quarter with lots of activity. The latest uh, branch portfolio of MX as we launched in August last year uh, if you remember, with uh, improved performance and integrated LTE modems continue to be extremely popular with customers across the board. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check those out, I definitely recommend uh, doing so. For today's session, I'd like to um, spend a little bit of time uh, talking about uh, two main topics. First of which is uh, tag-based IPsec VPN. And secondly, I'm going to have a few announcements or a couple of announcements of some exciting new features and integrations we now have available in public beta or beta. So tag-based IPsec VPN failover, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but I'm very pleased to announce the availability of this. And it's actually a very significant step in the evolution of our SD-WAN. Essentially, what this allows um, is for Meraki MXs to extend SD-WAN to third-party VPN peers, uh, which could be uh, data centers, as shown in the example. Um, and the example is actually pretty typical um, in terms of VPN topology uh, for an enterprise, where branches form primary and failover tunnels with two data centers. So let's talk through how tag-based IPsec VPN works. Well, if we use this example in particular, if we assume that this branch here has formed a primary uh, VPN tunnel to London, and we want to use that as uh, the primary, but we also then want it to fail over uh, to the Paris data center, 
uh, which has the same resources as the London one, if the performance of that primary tunnel degrades. But the standout issue here is that we don't have an MX in um, the London or the Paris data center. But what we can do is we can go ahead and um, add London and Paris data centers in the dashboard as non marquee VPN peers. And that's something that's been available for a while. Um, and then we can go ahead and define the IP of the primary data center. So let's say, for example, that's London. So we can go ahead and um, put in the IP address of the London data center uh, and track it. And the way we do that is uh, in security in SD-WAN, and we can go to traffic shaping. Um, we can go ahead and input it in terms of uplink statistics. So now the MX at the branch is actually sending uh, IC, ICMP requests to this IP in London uh, in, the da in that data center to track its performance. Now the performance of um, that tunnel uh, can be represented in dashboard, but also we can take a look at the um, performance and request what the performance is like. And we do this um, by measuring its loss and latency by an API endpoint that Melissa was talking about earlier on that was released earlier this quarter. So in the dashboard, what we can also do and the way we basically have the behavior of one tunnel moving over to the other for a non Meraki uh, VPN peer is that we can go ahead and tag that primary tunnel or that network that represents the primary tunnel in the dashboard um, as up. And then the secondary, which is the Paris tunnel, is down. And we can then run a script, an API script, to basically say and, and, and measure essentially that uh, primary tunnel to London. And we can go ahead and in that script put a maximum threshold of what we deem to be acceptable performance to the London data center. So it could be a loss packet loss metric um, or a latency. So if it's packet loss, for example, we can say if latency to that non um, Meraki VPN peer in London exceeds 30%, uh, then go ahead and choose uh, or fail over to the Paris data center. And then because this is all being done by a script, this is very highly customizable. You can cust customize exactly what that um, value is, how often that call uh, measuring performance of that tunnel should be. All of that's possible. So for a complete guide on um, how to actually go ahead and, and, and do this, and, the, and, and including sample script, that's all available on docs.maraki.com. So this is <clears throat> excuse me, pretty cool stuff. And we'll actually have more along the lines of this in the new, near future. So uh, keep a lookout for that. I did also want to take a couple of moments to announce a couple of uh, public betas that's now available. Uh, Neither of these need much introduction, so we won't spend too much time here. But uh, as we have on the MR side, we have uh, public beta available for uh, Umbrella integrated um, to the MX in much the same way that it is on the MR side. And I'm very excited to also announce that uh, Ike V2 is also in public beta now. And if you're interested in trying out any one of these two, uh, what you'll need to do, first of all, is be running the uh, beta or beta firmware. And then uh, do please give uh, Meraki support a quick call to enable this features the features for you. So Meraki Insight. So Meraki Insight has had a very, very hockey stick like uh, growth. Um, we've seen some great excitement ever since this launched. So actually, when I'm talking about Meraki Insight to customers, when they, they actually physically start leaning into me, and that's always a great sign that you're onto something that uh, customers like. I'm very excited to announce that uh, Meraki Insight is now available in GA across the entire MX portfolio. So previously, you did have to, on um, some uh, models of the MX, run beta firmware in order to uh, have Meraki Insight running on that device. But now, um, after Wired 14.39 went to GA um, a few weeks ago, this is now available for the entire portfolio. So if you have an MX today, uh, you can go ahead and start a free trial of that on GA firmware. Um, so it's something I'd highly recommend as a quick reminder of what Insight does. It's a software overlay to the Meraki MX right now. And it's a couple of main use cases uh, for organizations that are using more and more cloud-based applications. Things like Office 365 is a prime example of those. You can go ahead and use um, Web App Health 
to track the performance of applications such as that, as well as um, a feature called WAN Health, which gives you a, a dashboard view of exactly how all of your WAN links across your entire organization are performing. And that includes uh, cellular uplinks as well. A little bit of an update over the last quarter on Insight, we added a much requested feature uh, from, from customers to be alerted by email when an application performance degrades beyond a threshold that's been assigned by a network admin. So in this example, for uh, we've got Windows Office 365 and showing a server issue here. And so once that happens, you're automatically uh, sent an email alert and the email alert looks something like this where the IT admin, or you can actually go ahead and choose who to send these alerts to, are sent this email to immediately tell them that there's an issue going on. And what I'm actually going to now do is uh, flip over to my dashboard to give you a very quick demonstration of exactly what this looks like. Okay, so we're going to go dive straight into Meraki Insights. So what we're looking at here are the web applications that we're tracking as an organization, as a Meraki organization. And uh, we've got a view of their health over the past couple of hours here. So you can see we're tracking Google Drive, Gmail, some secure Meraki traffic, uh, salesforce.com, Office 365, of course. Um, these are very simple to set up. And really, the way we elegantly go ahead and apply a check for a X mark next to the LAN, WAN, and server is basically just come into edit here. You can go ahead and define uh, how you uh, deem the acceptable performance of this application. So by uh, per flow good put, and by the maximum tolerable application response time. So the new feature that I just talked about is right here, manage alerts. So if any one of these applications that we are tracking, let's say for example, Office 365 degrades below threshold that we've gone ahead and defined, we can go ahead and shoot off an email to any one of the recipients here. And it's really that simple and straightforward. So I'm gonna Hand back over to Simon now. Thanks very much. There we go. Looks like we're back on now. So I'm going to uh, pass things across to Meredith, who's going to talk to us briefly about uh, the Meraki community. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Meredith, and I am the community engagement manager for the Meraki community. Uh, I imagine a lot of you in the audience are already active members of the community. Uh, so to you, we just want to say thanks, and we're glad to have you. Uh, keep coming back. I'm also sure there are a good number of you who haven't actually heard of the community, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Uh, the community is our forum for partners and customers to ask and learn from each other's experiences. As you can see in the screenshot here uh, on the right of our homepage, there are discussion boards for each of our product lines. Currently, there are over 17,000 members on the community who have contributed over 45,000 pieces of content over the past year and a half since we launched. It's really been quite active. Uh, so if you want to ask a question about any of our products, or you just want to quietly peruse advice on best practices from your peers, please do check out community.meraki.com. Once you're in the community, uh, you'll find our members are super knowledgeable and also really quite nice. Um, check out this comment from uh, one of our members who recently said, I am amazed and impressed by the responses to questions posted here in this community. My early apprehensions about being treated with aloofness disappeared in a hurry. I now kick myself for not communicating with you good folks earlier. Also, the community isn't just a plain old forum for questions and answers. It's also generally a fun place uh, where you can win cool swag, show off your Meraki knowledge with profile badges, and post pics of yourself and your pets sporting fly Meraki gear. And speaking of swag, um, next week we'll be running a community contest in which we'll be hiding virtual Easter eggs around the community. The first to find each egg will win their own Meraki gnome. Uh, if you sign up in the community right now at community.meraki.com, you'll get an email when the first Easter egg is hidden. We hope to see you there, and thanks. All right, thanks, Meredith. Uh, we have 
uh, used up so much time during the last uh, 57 or something minutes that uh, we're almost out of time now. I'm just going to have a very quick look at a couple of questions, uh, just get a couple of those shared with you. Uh, one of the ones that we often get asked, of course, is uh, what happens to the content here. Uh, we always record these uh, quarterly. We know that there's a lot packed into this hour, a lot, of, lot for you to concentrate on. Uh, so we want to make that accessible to you, and we will certainly have that up and online uh, again very soon. I think our attendees here in the office have been furiously typing away throughout the past hour, uh, doing their best to keep on top of all the questions that have come in. It's been really uh, exciting to see that. I think one of the things I definitely want to re uh, reiterate is, uh, first of all, the 429, so April 29th uh, announcement that uh, we're making as far as our new developments on Wi-Fi 6 is concerned. That's definitely one you won't want to miss, so do look out for an invitation uh, to that, which will be coming your way again very soon. Um, I was actually really amazed to see uh, a feature which I have seen so many requests for over the past few years on, um, online uh, around Ike v2 finally coming to the platform. So I'm, I'm personally super excited about that. I hope you guys are as well. Uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a few of you on the line who have previously asked for that feature as well. Okay, so let's just have a look at a couple of questions. and. Um, hope you found the, uh, the sessions useful. Don't forget that that community is there to help you. Uh, you know, Meredith obviously gave you a little bit of an insight there into how the community works. You'll find Merakians in and out of the community all the time trying to help uh, answer some of the questions that you may have. So it's definitely a resource I would recommend uh, making use of in between. We had a few questions around the camera, which was very exciting to see. Um, that new version of uh, motion recap is really a, a great improvement uh, on the previous version. I think it really does make it way easier to see uh, that stuff. We had some um, simple questions around the MV, which we often get uh, around storage. So the, the MV cameras themselves have uh, onboard high capacity storage, which enables them to store uh, up to around 90 days worth of footage on the camera itself. Uh, using some intelligent ways of discarding uh, useless video that really doesn't help you at all, so where there's no motion, for example. So we can really um, get a long way with just the camera on its own, but we have also introduced a, a cloud archive facility to enable you to back that off for even longer than that if you need that for compliance reasons or uh, company policy reasons, whatever that happens to be. We also had a question around audio uh, on the cameras. So the second generation cameras do have this. That's everything we've introduced from the MV12, that's about a year ago now, uh, have uh, the audio capability as well. They also have wireless so that you can have those uh, out in more remote locations where you may not have uh, power uh, provided in the normal way. Um, we had a question around uh, the device enrollment program. Looks like we got that one answered. So that's on the, on the systems manager product and obviously helps you to make sure that your Apple devices are properly locked down uh, from the get-go. All right, we're out of time. We had to rush through the questions a little bit there at the end. It just shows how much we've got packed into this hour. Uh, I hope you found it a useful uh, way to spend an hour with us. Uh, we're really happy to have had you along with us and look forward to being back again in another quarter. I can guarantee you there will be plenty more content to keep us on our toes for that hour. So thanks again for joining. Have a great day. We'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.